Hi guys, I'm Seth Golden. Uh, what I wanted to do, uh, I threw some slides together just yesterday. I um, wanted to go over casually a few cognitive biases. I mean, all of us in this room are biased in specific ways, and we think we use reason to investigate truth and uh, kind of this romantic view that we're always just assessing ideas rationally, but the truth is that our biological machinery just isn't equipped for that, um, and we fail in systematic ways. So uh, I, what I was going to do is just give you some ammunition um, to show you how we systematically fail. Um, just going to go over a few biases. So to start, um, I'm going to show you this list of names for 10 seconds, and I want you to try to read through all of them. That's about right. If you're not finished, it's okay. All right. Uh, now, were there more men or women on this list? Think of an answer. Uh, you might be thinking that there are more women on the list, but you'd be wrong. Uh, if we look, go back through this list, uh, it's more men, but um, women's names are famous. Uh, they're more, and so you're you're able to more easily recall the women. Uh, what we do, uh, and this is called availability bias, we think we can somehow rationally assess the frequencies of something, but more often what we do is we uh, update our estimates of the frequencies by what we perceive is more readily available um, instead of actually seeing what occurred more frequently. So, why do we do this? Um, we have what scientists, psychologists call these heuristics. They're essentially, they're cognitive shortcuts and they're fast and efficient strategies for, uh, that may facilitate decision making, um, but they don't guarantee that a solution will be reached. And we contrast this, to, oh sorry, we contrast this to an algorithm um, as a well-defined sequence of events that virtually guarantees a solution to a problem. So, if you've lost your keys and um, you just go about your house looking for them, that's a heuristic. Whereas if your roommate says, oh, hey, I moved your keys into the mug on the counter in the kitchen, that's going to be an algorithm that tells you exactly what the solution is. Um, so let's do another one. Let's try this. Linda's 31 years old, single, outspoken, very bright. In college, she majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Now, which is more likely? That A, Linda's a bank teller, or B, that Linda's a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement? A. Now, okay, I'm, I'm glad you guys are saying A. Uh, the results for a study done by uh, so the guys who pioneered this work um, were Kahneman and Sversky. Uh, and I can actually, I don't have citations on the slide, but I can, if you guys want, you can email me. I'll dig all up. I'll dig up all the studies for you. They found in 1983 that 89% of participants thought that option B was more probable. If you don't see what's wrong with this, uh, <laughs> it's, it's just factually impossible uh, because people think, well, People think with more information that they're getting a better picture of Linda, but they're factually narrowing the pool of, of attributes that they can have. For every attribute, it gets less and less probable that, um, for the story that you're telling. Um, it, yeah, this is called the conjunction fallacy. All right, next up, we have... Uh, a study <laughs> where uh, psychologists, sure. psychologists uh, took data from uh, interviews from 70 engineers and 30 lawyers. Keep that in mind. And then they gave descriptions to participants and g they gave them these descriptions and they, they tried to um, get people to guess which, which uh, a lawyer or engineer people were. So in the first one, Jack enjoys reading books on social and political issues. During the interview, he displayed particularly high skill at argument. 
Tom is a learner who enjoys working on mathematical puzzles during his spare time. During the interview, his speech remained fairly abstract and his emotions were well controlled. And three, Harry's a bright man and avid racquetball player. During the interview, he asked many insightful questions and was very well spoken. Now, participants thought uh, one and two are easy. One, more likely to be a lawyer. Two, more likely to be an engineer. But this is really frustrating. For three, they thought it was equal. Even though, remember what the base rate was, 70 engineers and 30 lawyers, any one of these people are more likely, more than twice as likely to be engin an engineer than a lawyer. Uh, did I get that right? But yeah, engineer is a lawyer. So the mechanism that we use to make the decision is judging probability by comparing an object of the group uh, by comparing the object to a prototype of the group, what does a representative of the group usually look like? Um, and it works in a lot of instances, but not when we already know the rate. We just forget what we know beforehand. <clears throat> uh, this is called the representativeness heuristic. We judge the representativeness of a group instead of what the actual, uh, what is the fact that we're looking for. Um, one more. No, a few more. Um, OK, framing. <laughs> this is maddening. This is the same thing. <laughs> if you call a drug 70% effective uh, or having a 30% failure rate, it's, it's mathematically equi equivalent. But because of the language you use, uh, you come to different conclusions. So. Here, we can read this really quickly. Um, you you, OK, you leave home in the morning with $60 in your wallet. You decide to see a play where the price of admission is $20. As you enter the theater, you discover that you have lost a $20 bill. Would you still pay $20 to buy a ticket to see the play? If you would, you just value it at $20. Now, if we say this a little bit differently, you leave home with $40 in your wallet and the ticket to a play you want to see. That ticket costs $20. But as you enter the theater, you discover that you've lost the ticket. It costs $20. Um, and it wasn't, you can't get it back. Would you pay $20 to buy another ticket to the play? This is mathematically equivalent. But uh, in the second case, you have this tri you, you're accounting mentally for where your dollars went. Um, you say, oh, I'm paying $40 for this ticket now, but not really. You, that's lost. That's a sunk cost. Um, yeah, this is called mental accounting. It should be the same. It is mathematically, but because we're categorizing things and kind of loose with how we're understanding things, we might be tempted to make a different decision. Uh, this is similar. Uh, I don't know how we're doing on time. Um, if things framed as gains or losses uh, come to different conclusions. I know this is breaking PowerPoint rules with jamming text in. Um, uh, if program, so if there's an outbreak, program A, is a, program A is adopted, 200 people will be saved, or one third probably that 600 people will be saved. Um, something framed as a gain and a loss. Sorry, I think. I think we should move on. The, the point's made. Um, all right. Uh, this is a study, another <coughs> frustrating one for our monkey brains. Um, we, uh, we, we can get back to it later. How much uh, they asked a group of, I think it was Toronto families, different, they just randomized it, got different families, and said, How much would you pay to save 2,000 birds from dying in an oil? spill or something. Uh, this is so topical. Uh, and they asked different groups, OK, you're going to, how much would you donate to, to, sorry, how much would you donate to say the 2,000 birds, another group they asked 20,000 birds, another 200,000. And the numbers they came up were astonishing. $80 for the 2,000, 78 for 20,000, $88 for 200,000, um, which makes no sense. The amount of good that you're doing should scale. But instead, uh, it's hard for us to visualize what those numbers mean. Um, you can imagine the bird kind of choking in the oil, but 
when it comes time to multiply the numbers and actually extract meaning out of it, we're so ill-equipped to understand that. Um, and this has broad implications for policy. I mean, when a politician talks about, say, uh, taxing or spending or cutting a program worth a million versus a billion, it doesn't mean anything. We don't know how to weigh what to do with that. Um, okay. So, are we stupid? <laughs> you have to remember that when we talk about these kinds of failures, um, uh, our brains are evolved for, um, for judging things. I mean, our brain it works in an economy of scarce resources, and it takes more cognitive effort to rationally sit down and think through a problem. Um, so a lot of times, these heuristics are good enough. It's just that we have to be aware for where they systematically fail us and understand that we're not stupid. Um, it's just that our mach I mean, we're biased because of our machinery. Now, I like to think that with equipping, with equipping us, um, this is a way of uh, arming us. So at least we have a fighting chance if we know how we fail. There's a danger in once you hear about these to say, oh, okay, that's great, I know about this, I'm not going to make that mistake again. Which is exactly wrong, because you of course are going to make these mistakes, it's just now maybe you can call someone else out on it, because it's hard to call yourself out on it, um, but you should uh, do so, understand what's wrong and why, and try to challenge your own beliefs. Um, there are a couple other points I forgot to mention. The, the availability bias is big on a good application of that, going back, is, um, oops, remember this, what is easy to recall, terrorism. Um, the chance of being killed by a terrorist is, yeah, really low, but um, of course we can imagine these devastating uh, nightmare scenarios and think that that's more probable and we would donate resources to, or allocate resources to try to prevent that. So, um, I don't know, I see this kind of everywhere, especially, especially um, well, another good application for us skeptics when we're talking about the paranormal um, are just, uh, so for something like cold reading, it, this is kind of a cousin of something called confirmation bias, where you just seek out uh, the fact you're already looking for and discount what you don't remember. So when a psychic's doing a cold reading and extracting information from a subject, um, afterwards a participant will remember, oh, I remember uh, he mentioned my cousin George. It's so great how he knew that, but that's easy to recall because it's personal. And we, uh, so it makes the psychic look so much more powerful, but in reality it's just our stupid monkey brains. Um, anyway, so that's all I got can take questions.